Dan, you're a busy, busy, busy man. Thank you very much for your time. My pleasure. Great to meet you again. Um, also, congratulations on the book. Thank you. Uh, I'll be completely honest. I, I think I've mentioned this in the past. Military books, I think since leaving. I don't know if you're the same. I know other guys are. Um, or people who served are difficult to. I find it difficult to read them, especially about my own my own unit. Um, I, I'm afraid of seeing inaccuracies or seeing something. Oh God, I don't like that bit. Uh, I'm two thirds of the way through your book. I've not completely finished it. Paratroopers, I read slow. <laughs> two thirds, two thirds of the way through, and it's uh, an amazing read. Um, I, I, I mean that. Uh, if it was not, I would not be two thirds of the way through. I would have put it down after chapter one and gone. I haven't read any more. I can resonate with a lot of it. Um, the military side of stuff. Uh, there's a, there's a particular bit that sticks in my mind, and you're on leave. You've come back from leave from Afghan. And you use some phrases in that paragraph you mentioned about your feelings and the exact exact phrases that I've used in the past. And maybe you have, Andy, as well, maybe. And it's, uh, you, you're not there, you're somewhere else. Mm. And and Carl at the time was saying it, you, you're not you, you're somewhere else, your mind's somewhere else. Explain, explain that feeling to me. Mm. Explain that feeling to me. Well, I remember being out in Afghanistan, desperate to get home for R&R, &R, desperate to see my family, desperate to spend time with the kids. And then when I actually made it back home, the truth of the matter is that I was thinking about what was going on back in Afghanistan. And I remember very clearly on one occasion we went into Salisbury, bought coffee, sat outside, beautiful day, sun was shining, people going about their ordinary business. And my mind was back in Afghanistan and I was thinking and worrying about what was happening there. I wasn't really in Salisbury having a coffee with my wife. I was still in Helmand province. And I think the reality is that when you've been through a very intensive situation, like many of us have experienced in Afghanistan or wherever it was, you can't just flick a switch and then all of a sudden forget about it and be back in your home environment. It takes a period of transition. And the reality is that the period of R&R &R is relatively short. I mean, it's a good thing that people come back and they've got the opportunity to see their family and have some time away from it. But that period of transition is probably not long enough. So you just about get to the point where you've settled back into the routine of being at home when it's time to go back to Afghanistan. Yeah, I think it's a, <clears throat> I think it's a different... Uh, I, I've said in the past, I think... Uh, I think R&R... Uh, &R, I think, well, the... the R&R, the &R, but the battlefield operational experience is different. For every, Everyone finds it different. Uh, but I think there is a, a stark contrast in how a commander experiences it compared to how not command, you know, it's subordinates, I hate using the term, but subordinates experience it. Um, I mean, part of that feeling, come back and on and on, hating it. I hated it. When I read that paragraph of yours, it put me straight back to my first couple of hours back in the UK, sitting not far from you, actually, is on the banks of the Thames with, with, a, with a, a lovely lady and uh, sat there having a having a beer and she was talking to me and I was not hearing her. The barman had come over asking for another drink. I had not heard it and she was having to, having to prod me, like having to prod me in the side of the arm. Hugh, Hugh, Hugh. I wasn't responding because one of the things you said in the, in the one of the things you said in the book is you're sitting, I think in Salisbury you were, right? Mm. You're sitting there and you're look, watching people go par, passing idly by and, uh, and then all of a sudden you couldn't understand it. How can you just go along with your normal lives? And I've said almost exactly the same things in the past. I hated them. I was sat in that. I was sat in a barn inside the Thames watching tourists go back and forth and all people, and I hated them. It was how dare you? How mm. dare you go doing this when my friends are out there doing that? Do you not understand what's going on? And at the same time, that logical wrangling of what on earth are you thinking? <laughs> they just they just do. <laughs> they just get just get on with it. But it's something that's very difficult to describe. A very difficult feeling to describe. Ought to deal with. Ought to deal with apart from getting back on the ground, you know. Um, did you have the same when you came back from the operation as a whole, when you finished the operation? I did. For weeks afterwards, my mind was turning over what happened, what we'd done. I think I was pleased to be back because I was mentally and physically exhausted, having been there for six months. It had been such a demanding period of my life. I mean, it was bad enough that... We were in Afghanistan fighting through a very difficult, challenging summer, but there were some particular pressures 
because I was particularly worried about my wife and I'd come to the company late and I wasn't as prepared as I might have been and that made it much harder. And I think every day I carried this weight of responsibility for my soldiers and the most important thing for me from the moment I arrived to the moment I left was getting them all back safely. But that is a big responsibility and there's no escape from it, there's no hiding place. You're the boss, you're in charge and every single day you're making difficult decisions and it wears you down, you know, the friction of being out there, the weather, the heat, the cold, the stress, the fear, it all in the end takes its toll. So by the end of the six months we were all knackered and I was, you know, I I sort of speculated as a bit in the book where I wondered whether if someone had said you've got to stay for another week, could I have done it for another week? I probably could have done it for another week, but I don't think I could have done it for another month. You know, I was pretty much spent. And it was wonderful to be home. But for a period of time, I was still out there. I was wondering what was happening. We'd formed a very close bond with the Afghans that we'd been working with and living with. I was wondering how they were. I was wondering how C Company would come and take it over from us. I was wondering how they were getting on. And then quite quickly, as is the way in the army and certainly in the regiment, it's not that long before you're thinking about, well, what's next? And we didn't have that long. We had a period of time over Christmas, Christmas leave, and then we were back quite quickly in the January, spinning up for the next thing, getting ready, and Afghan sort of quite quickly seemed a distant memory, and we moved on to something else. But it took a number of weeks, I think, before I was even able to settle back into any kind of normal routine. What do you think the... In fact, I think an interesting one, the you, Andy, so you're obviously aware of, like, the... the the coming home routine from ops that it is now and was it similar in the northern ireland era back back then yeah i I guess it was very similar um you know you're on the ground four and a half months is a you know typical emergency tour um and you probably get a week maybe 10 days but yeah i think you know coming back into a normal environment um is, is very difficult and maybe Northern Ireland was was slightly different because you know you're on the streets of Belfast which could really be the streets of London or Birmingham or whatever so you know again it adds a different perhaps a slightly different dimension to it what's is is and the is your R&R not the R&R what do they call it post operation leave whatever you call it let's, say, let's call it post operation leave yeah how what how what could it be or should it be that, to improve it? Should it be the same for everyone? I think it's better now than it was when we were doing it. So this is 2007. And basically what happened is that at the end of a very demanding six-month tour in Afghanistan, we got back and there was a bit of admin and there was a bit of sort of cleaning the weapons and a bit of sort of tidying up. But quite quickly, people were gone. They were spread to the four winds. Now, for me, that meant that I went home to my family. But for a lot of the blokes, they went out to the pub or to the club or whatever it is. And quite quickly, after having been in a conflict situation in Afghanistan, they were down the pub. And, you know, inevitably, sometimes there are problems. And I think, looking back, I worry that we were perhaps a bit complacent about the impact that that six months had had on people. I I remember standing in front of the company saying, if anybody wants to have a chat, if anybody's got any problems, come and see us. Nobody ever did. I think now um, there is a slightly more enlightened culture of people feeling that it is safer to come forward and say, do you know what? Actually, it has been tough. I am struggling a bit. But then I think people just didn't have the confidence to come forward because I think they felt that that would be held against them and my worry is that that has stored up all sorts of problems for the longer term it's what just into to march now so my understanding is that some 14 or 15 veterans have already committed suicide this year alone that is deeply concerning now none of us know the precise reasons for all of those people but i know from my own contemporaries of people i joined with the army three have committed suicide over the past 18 months 
So I don't think we can ever f- afford to be complacent about the impact that putting people in the most stressful situation you can ever imagine. There's nothing like it. There's nothing harder. There's nothing more mentally demanding than being in a conflict zone. We should never be complacent about the impact that has on our soldiers. And however tough you are, however hard you think you might be, however think you've done the training that you're, you're prepared for it, I think we, we just have to keep an eye out for people. And I, th- I think the system is better now than it was, but I do worry about the longer-term impact of the experiences that, that so many young soldiers have had over the past generation or so and what it's going to mean for them over the longer term. And Dan, do you think, do you think that's changed? Because, you know, as you say, it's, it's not going back very long mm-hmm. that, you know, a lot of the guys just wouldn't come forward even though, you know, you were offering them a chance to have a chat. Do you think that's changed? Do you think, you know, guys are, are more willing now to ask for help? And do you think that the help that is available is actually better than it was? I think it has changed, and I think it's changed for the better. I think the systems in place are more enlightened than they would have been 10 or 15 years ago. I think I think the culture is shifting slightly, and I think that's a very good thing. But by its very nature, the armed forces tends to be a very macho in, in environment. I understand the reasons why, why that's the case. But I do think that we need to be incredibly vigilant, particularly with younger soldiers who could potentially go on to serve for many, many, many more years. We've got an absolute responsibility to invest in them and their mental health and their families. You know, It's not just about the people who've served, it's about the impact on the wider family. But also in, in our veterans, if you've put your uniform on, if you've served in the armed forces, I think our country has a lifelong responsibility to support you. And I think that we have got better as a country in recent years in terms of doing that, but we're still nowhere close to the level of support that you would get in the States. And I think there is more still that we can do as a country, and it's something that I'm passionate about pursuing in Parliament to make sure that government and our politicians understand the pressures that our young people have had to face in recent times and that there is more than sufficient resource within the system whether it's the NHS whether it's the criminal justice system whatever it might be to make sure that those who've served are properly looked after not just for the short term but for the rest of their lives. I don't think I mean with the states I don't think that (coughs) this is based on I had a recent conversation with uh, with a guy called uh, Dr Franklin Alice uh, he's a he's a he um it's an online like podcast snapshot called HR snapshot little bit anything and he's a what do you call it not reserve it's national guard he's national guard he's I think Nebraska he's in um and he was talking about the the Americans uh, men, uh veterans care you know the way they look after the veterans and <clears throat> he he had some reservations about it uh, some some aspects of it for example you know the see a little bit of you sometimes with, with charities they'll, they'll, a veteran's got a problem or oh, not just veteran or anything like this they've got a problem throw money at them um, and especially with the sort of medical claims and compensation all that medical problem chuck money at them and, and, and then a veteran may not ever have to work again in his life but that is absolutely going to kill him as much as the injury could ever would have you know uh, because in you know, all this money Nothing to do, no sense of purpose, blah blah blah, and it's just a spiral downhill. So he was talking about that and and their efforts to, as part of the rehabilitation, is not necessarily just throw money at them. I don't know, help them out if they need it, but let's get them into doing doing something they they see worthwhile. But I think where America does have it nailed is the the culture, the the sorry, not the culture, the PR, the PR that they have around the military to the civilians, the way civilians perceive the military. They're, they're, I mean, well, you know, you, you can go over there if you're a veteran, you, you get all sorts of stuff. You know, they, they stand up at the beginning of matches and they sing the national anthem and they'll all, all, you know, and they'll say thank you to the troops and stuff. That's where I think they're, they're very, very far advanced. But I don't think that's maybe, I, I would be a good thing for us to get at that stage in the UK. Maybe not. I'm not sure. It's hard to work it out. The problem is that... The, well, the problem is not clear cut. You know, um, a lot of the issues, the, the the issues that are in the mainstream, in the media, mm-hmm. are are around mental health and are around suicides. And then 
people in their head they love in their head they love the PTSD hashtag and love this and that and the other but you know it's um it's not that clear cut which means the solution isn't that clear cut. I don't think we I don't think we're moving in the, in, the, in the right way. Um, it's an interesting one because what I think we we often see here that the military charities obviously are doing a brilliant job and in order to raise funds you know they have to perhaps have a story well they have to have a story which often is around you know we've got veterans that you know are injured physically are injured mentally um so that is the kind of stereotype that seems to you know exist with lots of people that are looking potentially to employ veterans or service leavers but perhaps don't have any contact or knowledge really of the armed services so that's all they know but the reality is you know a lot of veterans are, are leaving and building very successful careers so i wonder if that's something that needs to change just in the in, in the way that you know veterans are, are portrayed within mm. uh, you know within the media yeah um, yeah yeah i think, I think yeah, that's something being looked at as well isn't it and that's yeah i agree well Sorry, I, th- I think that there is a balance to be struck. We've we've got to make sure that those people who've served in the armed forces who need help get it. And there's some wonderful charities out there that do an amazing job. But in the end, we, should we really have to rely on charities? I mean, mm. the bottom line is that, that that we do have to rely on charities to provide the support. <coughs> and that is incredibly important that, that that support is there. But at the same time, we do need to constantly be making the point that the overwhelming majority of people who've served in the armed forces and leave go on to be incredibly successful because they've got a lot of transferable skills. They nearly always have an incredibly positive Wilco attitude that means that they go on to be successful. And you know, that's you know, since I left the army and I've been in politics, I've employed a number of veterans. <laughs> they've all been excellent they've just got a brilliant work attitude just get on with it they know how to get things done they don't kind of mess about they're just very professional in the way that they approach whatever it is that they're trying to do so we d- we do have to make sure that as a society we look out for the people who need that support but at the same time we have to be quite careful not to undermine the overwhelming majority of service leavers who actually go on to be really successful and have very rewarding professional careers once they've left there's a balance to be struck there, I think. Yeah, no, absolutely. There are obviously there's always going to be a percentage that um, that need care and and should be cared for. And as you say, you know that why should that be just the charities? You know, there's a, there's a job for the government as well. Um, but I, I see and hear, you know, so many veterans doing great work. You know, setting up businesses, becoming successful entrepreneurs. You know, as you say, building careers, lots of different careers. Um, so, you know, it's it's getting that balance right. I don't think we hear enough in the media today about those stories. Um, so, yeah, I guess it's just ultimately over time trying to get the balance right. Talking about <coughs> mental health, one of the things uh, I know, obviously know now about you yeah, from, from, reading, from reading the book is... Um, man... Had a bit of a nightmare. Like you had, bit, you had a bit of a, you had a bit of a nightmare. You know, um, the uh, I mean, you got the operational aspects of the tours. Uh, people killed and injured, friends, um, colleagues, not just and British, Afghans, um, and then to deal with the obviously the tragedy in your home life personally. Um, how? How, what, how have you? How are you where uh, where you are now mentally? Uh, and that's me assuming that you are as you appear to me in the conversations we had. You're in a pretty good place mentally. Mm. How are you where you are now, and why are you not an absolute wreck? <laughs> that's a very good question. I think I've been lucky in the sense that having had a, t- a tough but rewarding career, or not a career, but period of my life serving in the army and then that was very difficult on occasions and really sort of challenging times and then a very challenging terribly challenging time in personal life when my wife died I think I'm very lucky to have come through that and I think the, the reasons that I've come through it are 
mostly because I've had very good support from friends and family. I think having people who you trust, whose advice you listen to, I think that counts for a lot. I also think, though, that I've been lucky that I've found something else that I can dedicate my professional life to. So the army, it's not a job. It is a way of life that consumes much of you, all of you, if you let it. It's not five days a week and it's certainly not nine to five. It is not a normal job and it's not a normal way of life. Politics is not a job either. It is a way of life. Uh, It is a vocation. And I think I'm lucky in the sense that I have the opportunity to do something that I consider to be worthwhile. So every single day, I've got the opportunity to serve my constituents, to get things done, to make a difference. And I find that extraordinarily professionally rewarding. It's hard work. (laughs) You get a lot of grief. And whatever you do, there will always be people who say you should have done something else or you'll get you get criticised. But it provides for me this, this amazing professional opportunity to dedicate myself to doing something that I think is valuable. And I think in terms of my own mental well-being, I think that's incredibly important. I also think having a family, you know, I've got three kids. You know, when my wife died, it was horrendous for all of, of us but I got two small kids. So I didn't have the option just to turn in on myself and just head up onto the moors and, and start wailing into the wind. It just wasn't an option because I've got to get two kids, just got to get them up, I've got to get them ready for school, got to pick them up from school. And that daily routine had to continue. And, you know, I had to be there for them. So I think a combination of family and kids and needing to keep the show on the road and having good friends and family who were able to help me through the toughest of times, but also then being able to find something else that I could really commit to and really find professionally satisfying. So I think in, in that respect, I've been lucky. Um, but I'm not complacent about it because you know, politics can be a pretty stressful place to be. Joe Cox was a great friend of mine, you know, a huge amount of time and respect for, for Joe. And it was horrendous what happened to her. And all of us now in public life, on a regular basis, we get threatened, we get abused, you know, we get death threats. None of that is nice. And you have to have the thickest of skins. But I think I'm quite lucky in one sense that all the stuff that I did before, it was harder. It was tougher, it was more challenging, the level of risk was much greater. And I think, to go back to my point about veterans... I think that gives you an experience and a perspective that when there's some nonsense happening today, it's not as bad as what happened in your previous job or your previous life. And therefore, it gives you that experience, that judgment, that perspective that means you're not overly phased by it in the way that perhaps other people might be. So, yeah, it's been a tough 15 years. And the purpose of writing the book was because I just wanted to try and make some sense out of it. I wanted to process it in my own mind in a way that I hadn't done previously and that's been incredibly helpful to me I feel much better for doing it I feel like a weight has been lifted off my shoulders but the main reason I'm doing it is because I hope it will be helpful for other people and that sort of sense of grief and loss that's something that most of us go through at different times in different ways I've been at a funeral this morning you know a friend of mine his wife's just died from cancer same age as me a lot of people have asked me about it over the years and what I've tried to do with the book is condense all of my thoughts and everything that I've learned from that incredibly painful journey through grief but to do it in a way that has been helpful for me in terms of getting it off my chest but also will be helpful for other people who've you know, been or are going through that difficult experience themselves. How long did it take to write? Two years? Did I see that? It's, did I read that? Two it, years? It's, it's pretty much taken me five years. Five years. It's been a labour of love in the margins of life and other things on the train between meetings I've sort of scribbled notes and it's taken me five years to do it so it's been a long old time I can imagine because if it's any like the way I was reading it and the way sometimes I think about things um from from I serve and I, I think I'll read something as I did with that paragraph and I re- and I read something that paragraph that you sit in Salisbury and f- that was me for 15 minutes mm. I wasn't reading the book anymore I was back in my own head mm. from from 10 years, uh, well, 14 years ago now with that. So trying to pen that down and I can imagine all the emotions and all the memories that it brings up. Because <clears throat> there's things that, 
you guys must have both experienced this, this thing is very odd. There are memories that you've forgotten and it takes one person saying one or two or three words in some random setting and then all of a sudden you remember this thing. You think, how could I have forgotten that? How could I have forgotten that? And it could be something that happened to you. It could be like a, it could be something else, some hideous event or some like f- highly amusing event. You think, how could I have forgotten that? And it brings it back up. And that's with, the, especially with the medium of, of, of writing. We don't do it very often anymore. Not like that, not, not properly. I mean, I can imagine, you know, I tried, I tried in the past to do something like this. And uh, I never get past the first paragraph. <laughs> Guess what the first paragraph I was always starting with? The sat in a bar on the terms, hating everybody. And I never get past it because I go back at it myself, which is why, again, that, that resonated with so much. The other one was... Um, the other one was uh, the, the sense of... not The sense of guilt for not being there. When you're a commander and you're not being out there. And, and even when you hadn't taken over the company, I remember you... you you're taking over the going out to take over the SMSG company. Mm. They're already on the ground. You're going in as a new company commander, mm. and because they're on the ground before you, you're not very happy. You're not very happy with that. You, ju- mm. you spend all your might to try and try and try and get there, but the helicopters ain't happening, and uh, you get wrapped up in Bastion, not Bastion, Kandahar, mm. Kandahar. What's that like taking over a company of paratroopers on the ground in Afghan? You've not met them before. It was tough, <laughs> and <laughs> I reckon. So. I, don't, I mean, looking back, I'm not quite sure how we got ourselves into that situation. I don't think it would happen today. I think there would be a more common sense approach taken to it. In what in what regard? Would you? In in regard that the armed forces rightly place a huge amount of emphasis on pre-deployment training. So if you're going into an uh, operational environment like Afghanistan, there is a period of training which is often months of hard deployment work pre-deployment training work so you know you know as much as possible how all the equipment works what the situation's likely to be and obviously you need all of that and I didn't have any of it and I don't think that I would be allowed to put myself in a situation like that these days without having gone through all of the pre-deployment training so it meant that I arrived cold I didn't know any of the soldiers who were in my company, with the exception of two, and I hadn't seen either of them for 10 years. And then all of a sudden, I'm there. I'm on a helicopter, flying out of the camp, into the middle of the desert, jump off the back of the helicopter, off it goes, and then you're into it. And you're confronted by a group of people, all of whom know more about the situation than you. Um, I was very fortunate that I had, I had a brilliant company sergeant major who I had known... 10 years before and he helped me a lot um i had a good team of ncos and a good team of young officers but for the first couple of weeks it was hard graft because i didn't even know the people so you're getting to know people you're trying to understand the nature of the mission you're trying to get a grip of being in afghanistan and for me i was dealing with stuff from home as well so it was an incredibly challenging, difficult period. And I, re- I remember, and I describe it in the book, having come back out of the desert and being in my little porter cabin hut, just thinking, what have I got myself into here? Maybe I, for once I've bitten off more than I can chew. And I remember I wrote, I wrote this um, his email to the commanding officer saying... I don't think this is going to work and I've got real concerns about the nature of the operation and uh, the, the level of risk is too high and all of these things. And then I just flicked the kettle on, had a brew, got a bit of sleep, got up in the morning and then I thought, you know what, I'm not going to send the email. I'm here now, just just make the best of it, get on with it. I'm not going back. Yes, it is tough. It is far from ideal, but I'm here now, so get on with it and make a success of it. And that's what I tried to do. With uh, with 175 <laughs> Afghan soldiers <laughs> under your command as well, right? <laughs> yeah, well, that was, that was pretty challenging. <laughs> well, particularly when, I describe it in the book, a number of them went AWOL. So we're trying to build a force, we're trying to get this thing up and running to get them out there, take on the Taliban. It's a relatively new concept, working very closely with the Afghans and and ourselves. And then, and it's often the way in life, just at the point where you think you're just starting to kind of get a grip of it. You're starting to just feel a little bit like you're on top of it. 
and then no sooner had I sort of sat in my chair thinking, yeah, you know, this is this is going all right. Then a load of them walked out the camp. I thought, oh, God, you know, what are we going to do about that? And then a load more went. Deserted? Yeah, they just went. And we couldn't get initially to the bottom of why they were going. But obviously it was my job to build this force. And it was an, an Afghan force, you know, we, did, we did, uh, needed Afghans to build an Afghan force. And they were just going, taking the kit, and they were gone. And we had this very difficult situation where I thought the whole thing was going to implode on itself because they were all going to leave us to it, you know, camp in the desert. So quite quickly we had to try and get to the bottom of why it was they were leaving, very long conversations about why that was. And in the end we were able to put in place a solution that brought them all back. But for a number of days, I genuinely thought that the whole thing was going to implode and that we wouldn't be able to even see out our deployment. Um, but through some very, very patient negotiating, we managed to get them back and we managed to get the thing up and running. But it, it took a bit of doing. So why why were they leaving, Dan? What was the, what was the main reason? Well, you, you go to a place like Afghanistan... And when you're dealing with Afghan soldiers, it, it's a very different cultural dynamic to British soldiers. I mean, the Afghans that we served alongside were mostly brave. They were... Um, but they were, they were different beasts to, to our soldiers. They'd had different upbringings, obviously, and their perspective on the world was very different. And there were all sorts of power politic issues playing out. And I describe in the book the reason why they went and what it was all about and the relationship of an Afghan warlord and his ability to leverage influence on members of our force. And that was incredibly problematic. And, you know, not many of us really had had experience of dealing with those kind of sort of circumstances previously. So we were making it up a bit as we went along. But in the end, with a bit of help we were able to reach an agreement that brought them back, but brought them back in a way that we basically said to them, look, you know, if you do that again, that's the end of the matter. We've come to your country to fight alongside with you against the Taliban. You know, this is a matter of honour for us. And quite quickly, I think we were able to build what was a cohesive team where we you know, had real loyalty towards each other that's not to say it wasn't without its problems, because there were problems. Um, I'll talk about some of those. But um, in the end, what Afghanistan needed and still needs is a functioning security force that can keep law and order. The biggest problem that Afghanistan has ever faced has been corruption. So it's not necessarily just been about Taliban, or the Taliban's been a big part of that. It's not about um, the opiate trade. There are lots of problems uh, within Afghanistan, but the biggest one is is corruption, and you see it at all levels of society. And what we wanted to do is build a force that was free of corruption, that had all of the necessary skills and training to provide some amount of law and order in Helmand province so we could get on with the business of providing reconstruction to improve the lives of, of, of the people that was there, and that was what we tried to do. But, you know, it was sometimes easier said than done. And you mentioned, Dan, um, <clears throat> some of the some of the cultural differences. So, you know, how, how did they kind of manifest themselves and how did you kind of get around some of those? Yeah, well, there were a number of cultural differences and it placed um, me and, and some of the others in, in quite difficult situations on occasion because you had to make often quite challenging moral judgments. So... If you're building an Afghan force, you need experienced Afghans, people who understand the way in which Afghan society is made up, who know the places, who know the people. And having people with that knowledge is incredibly valuable to, to us as a, as, as a force. But if those people do things that you don't like or break the rules, you have to make some really difficult judgments about the, ex the extent to which you're prepared to tolerate behaviour that you wouldn't ever see in a British soldier in return for the fact that those individuals can provide useful support in other areas. And, you know, I wrestled with those judgments on many, many occasions. 
and that was all part of the challenging, complex life of being in Afghanistan in, in 2007. I don't know whether I always got it right or whether I always got it wrong, but what I tried to do was the right thing, to make decisions that were in the best interests of my soldiers and the best interest of the force, to put in place an arrangement that would um, give the people of Afghanistan the best possible chance of success and you know we're many years on and it's still a country that's fraught with difficulties but I think we did make some progress over that period. I always felt like <clears throat> in Afghan we were working alongside the Afghans um, be it ANA, AMP or sometimes even with the, the local elders who'd come in for sure I'm just you know we'd, 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 we'd develop a, a relationship you know and uh, I always felt like we were always on an, I was on a knife edge of Having them on side, and when I say, I mean they're happy engaging with me or as to the other side of the knife edge was them being extremely, extremely offended. Um, and I, 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 I can remember similar things in Iraq, although I didn't work much with Iraqis in the same nature as I did in Afghan. And I think <clears throat> um, it's because of that that the cultural, the, cult, the lack of cultural understanding both ways, as to them, them to us, and. The chuck on top the language barrier um, and then chuck on top an interpreter in the middle trying to interpret what you're saying and then trying to translate into uh, in, in, into, into the Afghans and I think that is uh, uh, that factor plays a, a part in the in the obviously plays a part in the bigger picture in terms of I, I, you've mentioned you think you mentioned it a little bit in the book you know, assume the rack Island, Iraq, Afghan. Was it right? Should we have gone there? You know, will we ever know? Do we know now? Um, and I struggle with that question. I don't struggle with it. It's a question you can't answer. It's to the point where it's like, I'll put it at the back of my mind, let's just see what happens in his, and see what happens when history plays out, if you like. But one of the things I'm always very conscious of, I'm always very conscious of now is that what we think is the right, thing to do and the moral thing to do going forward based on our western principles and the way we were brought up in England, Wales, Scotland, America or wherever is often a far cry from the values and the and the principles and the expectations that people in a different country have in Europe never mind in the middle east you know is a hard one hard one should we well like you know should should we, how 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 can you judge it how can you judge what you should do, should and shouldn't do? Should we leave people just get on with their own lives and if they come and threaten us, then we act on it? But then what's a threat? You know? Um, it's a hard one. It's a hard one. I always think back to Iraq and think and think back to Iraq uh, in that 2003. In fact, you were there. In, yeah, 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 yeah. So you were the Arch and I was, I was just a private <laughs> as a Tom and A coming on the ground. And um, one, of the, one of the key, one of the key objectives was Secure the oil fields. <laughs> yeah, <right. laughs> it tells you tells you something. Tells you tells you part of it. Part of the motivation is a hard one. It's a hard one. I don't know what the answer is. I don't know what the answer is. What I do know is that um, as much as we think we're right and we're the good people, the British and the Americans and our allies, the Chinese think exactly the same. The Russians think exactly the same. The Afghanis think exactly the same. They're all right, just as right as we are. It just they've got a different perception of it. Different. Moral stand, you know, different, different values, different everything. I don't, I don't understand what to do, but the answer there is to well, we don't go attacking anyone, or don't do, any, don't do any interventional stuff, interventionist stuff. But then that's not the answer either, because then you're vulnerable. It's oh, I hate it. Why did I bring it up? <laughs> <laughs> what do you? How do you think? What, how do you think it's going to play out, Afghan? Do you think, on the whole, looking at it now, judging from your own experience being there? Um, would the Afghans say they're in a better place now than they were before? Or, I don't know. Well, f f firstly, on your very bigger picture point <laughs> <laughs> about intervention, I, mean, I, think it, I think it's worth making the point that we've spent such a long time thinking about our involvement in Iraq. So the Chilcot inquiry went on for years and years, and we've expended so many column inches thinking about whether it was the right thing or whether it was the wrong thing. We did that for Iraq. Our commitment to Afghanistan was much longer. 
we lost many, many more British lives in Afghanistan. It consumed much more of our national resource than ever Iraq did. But we've spent relatively little time thinking about whether it was the right thing to do or not. In the end, I think it was. But I think it's right that we look back at it with something of a critical eye because the world is so complex. There's so many different challenges now. Things happen much more quickly than ever they happened before. The reality is that we are going to have to make, as a country, difficult judgments about what to do in the future. We're making them today. We're going to have to make them tomorrow. We'll have to make them next year. And I think it's only by looking back on the decisions that have been made previously, not with a view to you know, hold people to account necessarily or to criticise what went before, but just to, to think about how we've acted as a country and work out whether it was the right thing to inform what we're going to do in the future. And there's about to be now a massive strategic defence and security review which provides the opportunity to do that. In terms of Afghanistan, is it in a better place than it was 20 years ago? I think, I think it is in a better place. But it's still got a very, very long way to go. It looks as if an agreement has just been reached between the US government That's right, and yeah. the Taliban that will lead to the end of the US NATO mission in Afghanistan at some point uh, in the not too distant future. But what there isn't is any kind of process of negotiation either really between the US and the Afghan government, so the democratically elected government of Afghanistan, and the Taliban and the government of Afghanistan. So... I'm afraid there is still a huge amount of uncertainty. There's still a very dangerous situation in much of Afghanistan. And you know, some people will say, well, you know, it's always been like that. It's always been a, you know, a very war-torn country. But given we've invested so much in it, given that we've sacrificed such a lot, I think we should continue to maintain an interest, maintain an interest in it. We've still got British soldiers there today. And I think it's in our national interest to make sure that it doesn't go back to where it was in back in sort of 2000 or so where you'd got a taliban led uh, government if you like that enabled terrorist activities that were then able to strike into the heart of, of western democracies so there are some very difficult balances to strike there are some diff difficult judgments that have to be made but at a point where Britain has left the European Union, I think it is important that we continue to be engaged in the world in a responsible way. You know, Britain is still a significant player, not to the extent that it was a generation or so ago. But I think we have a responsibility to use that influence and that power wisely and for the good. And that's very much what I hope that this government will seek to do. So we've got <coughs> the newly formed um, Veteran Affairs Office. Dan, what, what do you think about, you know, the work that um, that, that office has been set up to do? Obviously, it's very early days, but, um, you know, I think it's great to see the government, you know, really focus on veteran affairs. And, you know, as we said earlier, there's, if we look at what's, you know, what happens in the in the US and the way that, that veterans get treated there, um, obviously, it's not perfect, but it's very different to the way it is here now. So are you, you know, are you... Are you confident and kind of positive in regard to the office and the difference that it can make? I'm certainly very supportive of the principle of having an Office of Veteran Affairs. I think that's a really good move forward. Like everything, the proof of the pudding will be in the eating. So I've been in regular contact with the, the ministers, Johnny Mercer and, and, and others. And I think what it needs to do now is prove its worth in terms of the support that it's providing for veterans. There are some still some specific concerns about issues relating to service in Northern Ireland, and that's something that gets raised with me a lot. I have some specific concerns around quite a significant number of soldiers who've been disadvantaged as a result of what's called the, the Pinnacle Pension Scheme, and I've raised that with the Minister Johnny Mercer and I still want to see some decisive action coming out of the Ministry of Defence and the, the Cabinet Office through this new Veterans Office. So I think, yes, it is a good step forward, but what we need to see now is the thing properly up and running. And I think the, the Veterans Minister has said that he doesn't want any veteran ever to feel that they've got nowhere to turn to. I think we all agree with that. We all want to see that. I don't think we're quite there yet, but what I hope very much is that 
parliament and politicians will pull together. This should not be a political football. We've all got an interest in making sure our veterans, veterans are properly looked after. And I hope very much that in the near future we'll see that operation properly up and, up and running and no veteran will then never feel that they've got nowhere to turn to. Yeah, I know it's it's, it's early days, but it seems like a you know a very positive step forward. Um, you know, obviously a lot of work to do. You mentioned Dan also the you know the prosecution. So I know that's very emotive for lots of veterans. Yeah. You know, particularly veterans that served in Northern Ireland, because you know some of those guys are now you know sixties, um, and the threat. I suppose hanging over them of potentially then being prosecuted, um, you know that that's that's a big thing. So do you think, you know, with the with the new government and the office, that's something that essentially will be dealt with once and for all? I very much hope so. I mean, the prime minister and the veterans minister have both given a com- a commitment, so they've both publicly committed to ensuring that this matter, which frankly has dragged on for far too long is brought to a conclusion in the very near future. I mean, I've spoken to individual veterans who are affected by this, often older men, some of whom are quite unwell. Some of them have had to live with huge uncertainty for years and years, incredibly sort of stressful at any stage of life, and certainly for them. And I think there's a general feeling amongst society that there's a huge unfairness in the way that this has dragged on for so long. So... I'd previously worked with a number of secretaries of state uh, for Northern Ireland to try and bring this matter um, to a head and get it resolved to everybody's satisfaction. We're not quite at that point, but I very much hope that we will get there sooner rather than later. I think it's in everybody's benefits to do that. Going back, what is the, um, what's the pinnacle pension issue? So this is a, a scheme that a number of um, people who served in our armed forces transferred their armed forces pension into other pension schemes and a number of people quite a significant number of people have been disadvantaged financially as a consequence so there's been some very good work done by um, BBC Radio 4 you and yours program who've looked at this in some detail I've raised it uh, in parliament on a number of occasions I've I think twice now written to Johnny Mercer about it, but still there are hundreds of veterans who face financial uncertainty and hardship because they have effectively lost their pensions through this this scheme. I'm still waiting for a solid response from the MOD so they've acknowledged that the concerns that exist. But this is not going to go away, and it is a matter that I'll be working in Parliament to resolve, and I very much hope that the... The new office that we've just been talking about, it provides them a fantastic opportunity to demonstrate their commitment to making sure these veterans have not been disadvantaged in the way that I think that they have. So it's quite a big issue and hopefully one that will be resolved by the MOD. That's people transferring their pensions from the MOD pension out to like a CIFPOP one? Yeah. Yeah, okay, got you. Yeah, <coughs> yeah right. Yeah, I've heard, yeah, it's a, yeah, that's not, I nearly did that actually. Yeah. Well, a number of people have done it. And I think there is a strong view amongst many who've done it that they didn't have uh, the sort of required advice about what they were doing. And in some cases, they've transferred it into funds that collapsed. Um, And there seems to have been a lag in the amount of time it's taken the MOD to stop people from doing it. So what I've said to Johnny Mercer is that there does need to be investigation into precisely what has happened firstly to make sure it couldn't happen to anyone else, but then look at what can be done to support those people who have been disadvantaged. A number of people have got in touch with me about it. And as I say, it is not something that's going to go away. It is something that we are going to have to try and resolve, but I do need the MOD to look at it properly. Is there a formal network of veterans within Westminster that exists? Cross party, obviously. I don't know. There's a, there's, a, there's a formal network. There are various groupings. There's an all party parliamentary group for the armed forces. There's a really good scheme called the armed, Force, armed forces parliamentary scheme, which gives members of parliament who haven't served in the armed forces the opportunity to go away and spend a bit of time with the three different services. And I think that's a fantastically good idea, because obviously most MPs don't have any direct experience of, of being in the armed forces. But often they're going to have to make decisions that will impact on the lives of people who are serving. 
So I think it's a really good opportunity for MPs to go and learn a bit more about what it's actually like. I think there is, though, an informal network. We tend to get on pretty well. There's quite a few of us who've served and are now in Parliament. They're mostly um, on the other side of the House to me. But I think there is a camaraderie amongst us. I mean, some of us have known each other from our time serving. And I think there is a mutual respect. And you know, one of the things that I, I miss most about the armed forces is that team spirit. It's that camaraderie. It's that being a part of an organisation alongside people who you trust, who you get on with, who you quite literally will put your life in their hands. I'm afraid, perhaps this won't come as a great surprise to people, that there isn't that same culture within politics. And even with, within your own political party, you tend to be, sadly, um, you know, not, not, not working always in the same way. Um, and that's a great shame in my view. Um, and I think there's quite a lot that politicians and politics could learn from that kind of will co can do attitude that people have in the armed forces. Particularly, you know, a, a tough time for our country. There's a lot that we've got to do. We've come through a very divisive Brexit debate. You know, I want to see people coming together and actually working in what is the best interests of our country. And I think the armed forces provides a really good template for how you could do that. You mentioned in the book. <coughs> Um, about meeting Tony Blair and you had an opportunity to discuss with him uh, was it what, in fact yeah tell me about that actually I'm, try, I'm trying to remember the actual, actual the, uh, when it happened explain that when did that meeting happen with Tony Blair well the first time I met Tony Blair I was trying to put him on a helicopter in the dark and we got lost in a wood <laughs> which was what, one of the most embarrassing things that's who, ever who was navigating well I I was navigating <laughs> But I maintain it was the it was the helicopter pilot's fault because he. So I, what happened was it was my it was my first day. So I was working for General Mike Jackson, who was is a fearsome character and Prince it, of Darkness. The Prince of Darkness. So he was the um, he was the sort of the, the head of uh, NATO forces in in Kosovo, and it was my first day working for him. And my job was to take the Prime Minister from where he just had a meeting with General Jackson and put him on a helicopter. And I'd obviously done a recce, so I knew where to go. But it was dark and it was my first day, so I didn't know my way around brilliantly. Anyway, I took the Prime Minister and his team of people towards where the helicopter was on the helicopter landing site. We had to go through a bit of a wood and it was a bit muddy, but it was all right because I knew where we were going. Anyway, as we came out through the wood, the helicopter took off and flew away. So I'd say to Prime Minister, a bit of a change of plan, Prime Minister, we're going to have to go to the other HLS, which is where I thought the helicopter was going to go and, and land. Anyway, so we went back through the wood and then we had to go through another wood. And I vividly remember at one point going through this wood that we had to get through a barbed wire fence. This was on my first day. With General the Prime Jackson Minister. was there with the Prime Minister. <laughs> and I put my foot on the bottom rung of the barbed wire and I was lifting up the, bar, the barbed wire. So the Prime Minister, Alistair Campbell, he was there as well. And, um, and there was... Um, as a woman called Angie Hunter, and she was um, wearing reasonably high heels. I don't think she was too impressed. <laughs> anyway, we got through the barbed wire fence, we got through the rest of the wood, and eventually came out the other side to where the helicopter landing site was, and the helicopter was there with the rotor blades spinning. Now, apparently, you're not supposed to put Prime Ministers on to helicopters with the rotor blades spinning. But anyway, I just put him on, and off it went. And it, obviously, it was my first day, and I thought, well, I was going to get the sack because it was my fault. Anyway, I was stood with General Jackson um, and we sort of looked at the spot where the, the helicopter had been but had sort of flown off and he looked at me and I thought, oh, I'm going to get massively in trouble here. I'm probably going to get the sack. And um, he paused for a moment, then he looked at me and he said, um, oh, thank God it wasn't the Queen. <laughs> so, which broke, broke the ice a bit. Um, so that was the first time that um, I met Tony Blair. Um I saw him briefly years later, just after I'd been elected to Parliament, and I asked him about... Did he remember that incident? Did he remember that? I, I didn't ask... Well, I didn't mention it to him, to be yeah. honest. Um, I mean, to be fair to him, he didn't seem too worried about the fact that he was being dragged through a, a dark, muddy wood. I think he quite enjoyed it. Uh, yeah, I bet um, he loved it. I bet he well, loved it. So. Yeah, well, when the heli as the helicopter was flying off, he gave me a bit of a sort of thumbs up, so I sort of <laughs> took it that it wasn't, wasn't too fed up. Um, but I didn't, because I, I only saw him very briefly, I didn't, I didn't get into all of that. 
Um, but we did have a conversation about the difficulties with making these huge judgments. And you need the wisdom of Solomon and, you know, much of the criticism of the decision to go to war in Iraq is with the benefit of hindsight, but some very legitimate criticism of those decisions. But I've now had some experience, although obviously not to the same extent, of having to decide whether it's the right thing to take military action or not. So we've done that with Syria, we've done it with Libya. And these are incredibly difficult judgments. And I think what you've got to do is you've got to look at all of the information, all the intelligence that you have available, and you need to have a proper plan for what it is that you're looking to achieve and how you're going to do it, and you need to have a commitment to achieving that over the longer term. And the debate about whether it was the right decision to go to war in Iraq or not will go on for many, many, many years, and and rightly so, because it was such a controversial decision. But what I think you also have to find a way to think about within that same discussion is what if we hadn't done it now that's not a reason for doing it but there are lots of people who will say well we should never do anything and i think there are occasions and that's obviously why we have our armed forces where if it's legal where if it's morally the right thing and if you're able to execute a force in a way that can save lives and contribute to the upholding of international law then that's the right thing to do but my time in parliament over the past nine years or so has taught me that these are very difficult judgments and you know whatever you do it brings risks and whatever you do there will be people who say you should have done something else so these really are the most difficult decisions and I think you know I, I, I feel whenever I've had to take them the responsibility I have is to those people who serve in the armed forces because ultimately what you're doing is you're asking them to put themselves in harm's way and there is no greater responsibility, there is no more serious decision that you can ever take than, than doing that. Question for you. Um, so before I, before I say this, I'm going to say I'm, I, I am not, uh, I've no allegiance to any party, right? You happen to be my first Labour, <laughs> Labour MP on. I've had a couple of Conservative before, obviously Johnny and... Um, Where's that one? No, no, no. Oh, Chloe Westley, the advisor. And then I had... Um, James Glancy of Brexit Party fame. <laughs> yeah. I don't hold any allegiance to a party. Okay, <clears throat> not even an independent Wales. <laughs> uh, is it possible? So your experience in Westminster, your experience working, working the upper echelons there. Okay, as an MP, he's been there for a, a while. Tony Blair gets dragged across the coals. People hate him, as people hate every Prime Minister, right? He gets dragged across the coals, specifically regarding Iraq. And the, 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 one of the points is um, he authorised, sanctioned war with Iraq, the invasion of Iraq, based on, um, military, uh, based on intelligence that he knew to be false. Or intelligence that are false. Little side note to that. I was still in, I did a PSYOPs, PSYOPs warfare planning course, and he ended up on their... I don't know why I was on as a sergeant, and then the next rank up was a flight sergeant from the RAF, and everyone else was majors and colonels. I was full of it for that week. I said, yeah, I'm on this course. So got my crayons out. I was loving it. Um, uh, the flight sergeant, RAF, according to him, and I at the time I believe what you're saying, he was one of the guys who was tasked to go in and protect the weapons inspectors in Iraq when they went doing the, the inspections. And he said to me, man, there was no inspection going on. We went to go to these places. Didn't even set foot inside and came off. It was an absolute bluff. That's single source of information. Like, I still believe him. My question to you, Dan, is knowing what you know now, is it possible that Tony Blair could have been presented false information, false intelligence, and not know about it and, and believe it to be true? Because I think it is possible. Is it possible? I, it, I think it's possible, but I, I just I just don't know. I mean, you and I were both out there in the desert at the time. And I talk about, in the book, about the fact that I was only peripherally aware that were huge demonstrations taking place in London, you know, hundreds of thousands of people on the street. But you and I had a job to do. We had a very important job to do to get our battalion ready for whatever was asked of us. And I think we did that in good faith and I think we can be very proud of the fact that we went there in good faith to do an important job as was requested by our country. 
I don't know precisely who said what to whom and what decisions were taken and, and, and when they were taken. But what I do know is those decisions have impacted on the ability of prime ministers and national government ever since to make those decisions. And in some respects, maybe that's a good thing because it means that we are probably more cautious than we otherwise would have been to take these decisions. I mean, we had some really tough choices about Syria, and I'm not convinced that we got all of those choices right. In fact, I'm sure that we didn't. But the reality is, perhaps a bit like the experience of being in Vietnam for the Americans, the experience of going to war in Iraq uh, for our country, I think will carry very long-lasting consequences for years yet to come. And I think it's you know, it's the job of the Prime Minister of the day and the, the government to ensure that all of the decisions that they take are in the national interest, are legal, and are informed by the highest quality of intelligence and information. And I suspect in years to come there will perhaps be more said about what happened in 2002 and 2003. I'm not an expert because, as I say, you and I were a bit busy doing other things. But I think the really positive point that I would want to draw out is about the future and about thinking incredibly hard about what we do as a country in the future when it comes to deploying our armed forces. I remember being in Parliament in, um, I think it was 2015, it was 2015, when we had to take a judgment about whether we were going to support the use of force in Syria. And I was invited by the then Prime Minister, David Cameron, to attend the National Security Council. And basically what the National Security Council did was provide a briefing on the situation inside Syria in order that those of us who were there were able to make a judgment about whether it was the right thing to do to use force in the case of Syria or not. I had the benefit of that knowledge and that intelligence from the National Security Council briefing. The overwhelming majority of other MPs didn't have the benefit of that briefing. So they were being asked to make a very difficult decision about whether we should deploy force without all of the kind of the intelligence and the information. And I think it's a point that I've raised in Parliament previously. If you're expecting parliamentarians to make a decision about force, the use of force and the deployment of our armed forces, how can you find a way of making sure that they've got all of the information in order to make an informed judgment? Because obviously much of that intelligence and information is very highly classified. So there's a bit of a problem there that we don't have a system in place that allows, other than the kind of the ad hoc arrangement of a couple of us being invited in to attend a meeting, there isn't a system that will enable the best possible decision making politically. And I think that is a bit of an issue that we, we do need to think about. But the most important thing is that any government, any prime minister needs to do the right thing, needs to act in the national interest, needs to take actions that are legal and in line with international law and and only seek to use force if there is a clear plan with a reasonable chance of success. And whilst for many people the legacy of being in Iraq will be a, a terribly negative one, I think I completely understand that. But what I prefer to do is try and think of it in terms of how we can do it better next time and how we can learn the lessons of that decision-making process to inform what might have to be done in the future. Do you see um, our leaving the EU compromising our national security? I think we have an absolute responsibility to make sure that it doesn't. I remember as part of the debate um, during the EU referendum in 2016 asking questions about how we would continue to be able to cooperate with our European partners. So in terms of our defence as a country, we do need to have very close cooperation with with our neighbours in the European Union. Now, because we are not part of the European Union in the way that we were previously, we need to find new mechanisms for doing that. I think it's entirely possible to make that work. I think it's incredibly important that we seek to play a leading role in NATO. NATO has provided the bedrock of our security in Western Europe for a generation or more. And it's right that we are absolutely sat at the top table as a, as a P5 UN security member um, contributing to that process. But I think that as we continue the process of leaving the European Union, 
obviously there's some incredibly important arrangements that have to be put in place to allow economic cooperation and our ability to trade into those markets and for them to trade into our market. But the very next most, well, just as important, if not more important, is is the mechanisms by which we share intelligence with our colleagues in Europe, the mechanisms by which we link into the existing security police structures. And obviously the government in the process of trying to make all of that happen. And again, that's something that I'll clearly, you know, I hope all parliamentarians will want to support that process. But I'll just sort of say one other thing. The world feels to me more dangerous, more complex than ever it's been before, really. And in the end, we might be an island, but the way in which we can best provide security for ourselves and for our neighbours is through partnerships and through contributing to organisations like NATO so that we can work alongside our allies. And we should, I think, use this moment of coming out of the European Union as a moment, and we're going to do this through the the process of the Strategic Defence Review, to think about what our priorities are, to make sure, and this is the really critical point, that we resource those priorities so that we have got an armed forces and we've got a security apparatus and a network in place that allows our country to be successful in the world and for our people to be safe. And there's nothing more important than doing that. And that is the responsibility that now falls to the new government. And you know, I genuinely hope that they make a success of it because <laughs> you know it's in our national interest that they do. But my job as a parliamentarian is to ask the right questions and to support that process. And I'll always seek to do that in a non-partisan, non-political way. Is there, are you aware of any concern in, uh, in, in Westminster of um, the potential destabilisation of the situation in Northern Ireland with leaving the EU? Because it seems, from, from, from the way I've been seeing it over the last year, to, over the flipping Brexit saga, that it seems to have been uh, capitalised on by not, um, not decent organisations or what you, we would used to call them paramilitary organisations in, in Northern Ireland and Ireland. I think that is a, it's a very important point. I don't think we should be remotely complacent about the potential ramifications of leaving the European Union. I mean, let me be clear about the fact that I think w- we must strive to be successful in the future. And I think it's perfectly possible that we can be successful in the future. But we can't be complacent about the future of our United Kingdom. I think having left the EU, the United Kingdom as an entity with England and Northern Ireland, Scotland and Wales becomes all the more important. Now I say that as someone who is very proud to be British. I say that as someone who spent different parts of my life in all of the different nations of the United Kingdom, of Great Britain and Northern Ireland. And I'm really proud to be British. And I think having left the European Union, what I don't want to do is leave the United Kingdom. And therefore, I think you're right to say that there are significant risks in Northern Ireland. I mean, the security situation in Northern Ireland has been quite fragile. Big political challenges there in Stormont. But also go to Scotland. You've got a Scottish National Party who are determined to leave the United Kingdom. And if that were to happen, the ramifications for the rest of what would be left of the United Kingdom would be very significant indeed. So I think this is a monumentally important moment for our country. And I think it's a moment where we need to stick together. You know, I passionately believe that Scotland should remain as part of the United Kingdom. I campaigned for that in 2014. And I very much hope that there won't be a second referendum up in Scotland. But if there ever were to be, I'd be absolutely campaigning for Scotland to remain in the European Union. But yes, Northern Ireland is a very important constituent part of our union as well. And therefore, it's right that there is a a renewed political process there to get people back round the table, to get the Stormont Assembly back up up and working. And that really must be a big priority, because if we are going to be successful in the future, we've got to make sure that all of the different parts of the union feel that they are valued and feel that they all have a, a stake in being British. And I think that is something that all of us who believe in that have a, a responsibility to make sure that that is the case. Mm-hmm. It is, uh, yeah. I, I, um, it is very strange 
Some strange, strange times, strange generation seems to have gone on. No, we've been, a, we've got a history as, as a hugely successful nation. I'm talking about United Kingdom, Great Britain, um, hugely successful, successful nation. But as, as we sort of come into the age of information, and the, uh, and the la- especially the last thirteen years, the social media, social media kicking in and, and completely changing. The way that we communicate, the way that, that we perceive information, the way we absorb information, and and the way that our opinions are formed, not just on who we meet and who we talk to, but on what we're reading online from people who never even would have listened to a million years ago or exposed to media outlets that we'd never even heard of before. And where we are at the moment, in terms of UK, is the ri- the risk of being broken up is heavier than ever the ri- but if that move towards in inverted commas independence you know standing your own two feet kind of thing but missing I agree with you Don you know we, we, we this is strength in numbers we know each other better than anyone else you know Scotland Ireland Northern Ireland Wales England we all know each other better you know and keep your friends close and your enemies closer right mm-hmm. <laughs> you know you break up it's absolute, ab- I mean ignore the e- economic impacts and the and all the rest of it just you're losing mutual support you know, you're losing. You, you, we're, we're a force multiplier together. Uh, uh, that's what I think. And plus, it's such an unknown quantity. It's Scotland to leave. I don't know. I, I can't. I can't imagine it would be great. You know, but why? Why? Why risk it? But I don't think there doesn't seem to be much public support for that up there, though, does there? Apart from Sturgeon saying she wants it, and the party broadly saying they want it. But I don't think it seems to have much. I mean, it's up there recently in Scotland. Recently, I was with a couple of ex militia up there, and they didn't. I mean, they weren't all for it. But it doesn't mean the whole of Scotland isn't. I don't know. What's the feel well, on the ground, Dan? I think. <laughs> look at some of the things that have happened recently that we could never have predicted, or that we've never thought would happen. I mean, you've got Donald Trump as a president of the United <laughs> States. <laughs> very true. L- <laughs> lots of people would have said you'd never get someone like that as a president, but that's what they've got. So I just don't think that we can afford to be complacent about it, given the importance of it to us as an issue. And it is about um, our economic power, but it's also about our social and cultural power. You know, I just think that we are, you know, to coin a phrase, better together. But we've got to think about the way in, w- in which all of that works and just not, not be complacent about it and kind of value the relationships with Northern Ireland, with Scotland and Wales, make them feel that they, like they are valued partners in that arrangement and i think if we can get that right that can be really powerful but get it wrong and there are real vulnerabilities and risk and particularly as we forge a new path outside the european union you know it's strength in numbers in the uk and then let's think about what we want to do and what we want to get done in the world and make sure that we've got the right resource in the right place because you know going back to some of the things we've been talking about earlier afghanistan and iraq and I, t- I do tease out some of this in the book. You know, was it the right thing? You'd sort of say Iraq was right or wrong or, or, or whatever you might v- view it as. But what we had was two concurrent commitments to Afghanistan and Iraq that were very significant, that placed huge pressure and stresses, stresses on our armed forces. We had Ireland at the same time. We did. There was we one point in Ireland at the same time. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, yeah. do you remember the expression running hot? The yeah. expression was running hot. Well, I think you know, it wasn't necessarily running hot, but it was, it was boiling hot, is the reality of it. And we only were able to sustain that for a number of years because of the dedication and commitment of some extraordinary men and women serving in our armed forces, particularly those who were in the kind of sort of pinch point enabling capabilities that were needed everywhere. And you had people who would do a six-month tour and then would have a relatively short period of time before they'd be spinning up to go back out there again. And I think um, it is about the politicians in the end providing leadership and making sure that if they say that they want something to be done, that they don't just kind of will the ends, they will the means and the resources to do it. But it's also about senior military people and them being honest about what can be achieved. And it's a very good thing that in the armed forces there's this kind of Wilco can-do attitude, and that's fine. That's incredibly important that 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 is maintained, but not at the risk of not being able to do things because you haven't got the resources in in, in place. So that's why this strategic defence review, I think, is so important, because it provides an opportunity to think about precisely what it is we want to do and what we want to be as a country, but then ensuring that through the Treasury that there's the 
adequate, or at least adequate resource in place to make sure that we're able to do it properly. You've got, um, sorry, Andy, you going to say something? No, I was going to say, Dan, I think, um, <clears throat> you know, it's it, it's interesting the way that, uh, you know, the kind of threats are changing, the, the threats are evolving, obviously, you know, fake news, Russian interference, all of that. So it feels like, you know, our armed forces have to, have to evolve. And I guess, you know, this strategic review is, is the best way of doing that. But you raised a point earlier, actually, which I, I think is interesting. And the fact that, you know, there's a limited number of, of parliamentarians that are veterans. I wonder if, going back to your point, they're really equipped, you know, to make some of those decisions about our future capability, um, you know, and some of the decisions that have to be made into, you know, operate future operations, if they've never if they've never served, you know, you know what it's like to be on the ground, you know, commanding, commanding men. Um, you know, I just, I just wonder if people aren't, you know, if they've never experienced it, are they able to really make, you know, kind of a valid contribution to, to the decision? Um, I don't know. It's, I think there's, 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 there's value in, not having experience as well, you know, it's, it's, that, it's that old diversity is key, right? So it would be, it'd equally be a bad idea to have all of them as ex-military. <laughs> yeah, no, absolutely. <laughs> you know, but, uh, but bring, uh, bring, it sort of broaches on the subject of national service. We've got a, we've got a manning problem at the minute. We've got a retention problem. We've got a recruitment problem. Um, national service, could that be an option? I've had my reservations in the past, but... I think I, I flipping the heck. This is another hour and a half conversation. <laughs> this, but just I mean, just coming, just coming towards finishing up. I mean, I've had my reservation in the past, but I do think on a wider positive impact on society to have a whole society who have experienced some form of military service, be it eight months, be it three years, be it twenty two, twenty five years, would have a positive impact on society. I think I think it'd be flipping awesome. We wouldn't have. I was going to say this the snowflake word. But I won't use that word. <laughs> but, but I think we'd have a lot more, a lot more resilient society. I think, uh, with um, a better handle on, man, what is really valuable in life? What is really valuable for you in life? What makes you tick? What is what is good and what is morally right and 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 the way you should take take your life for the good of you, for the good of your family, for the good of uh, and and a grander platforms the good of the country I don't know what do you think so so to confirm Dan you're saying bring back national service <laughs> Not, I don't think I'm <laughs> quite, quite saying that but I, 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 mean, I think certainly the, the opportunity for people to get involved with some form of service whether that is a, is a military element to that or whether there's a sort of community aspect to it I think you know I sort of say this as a as a parent as much as anything it's a tough time to be growing up at the moment. There are all sorts of pressures on kids that we never had to face. I mean, having a mobile phone and social media, this is extraordinary technology that brings extraordinary benefits, but it also brings some pressures as well. And I think for kids growing up in the world today, they're subjected to all of that. And I think um, having the opportunity to do something that would get them mixing with people from every single different walk of life would be very valuable. I suspect the military is not going to be for everybody. Um, I'm a big supporter of the cadets. I think the cadets provide you know, a fantastic opportunity for young people to be involved in adventurous activities, and I think that is a brilliant thing. And whether you go on into the armed forces or not, I think that gives you you know, a good sort of start in life. I also think it, it's really important that we support our reservists as well. I mean, I continue to be kind of completely dumbfounded by the ability of people to do a job, to have a family, but also serve our country through through the reserves. I think that's an incredibly valuable thing. So I'm not completely signed up to sending everybody off to, to, to boot camp for nas national service, partly because the truth of the matter is we haven't actually got the numbers to do it because you'd have to see a very significant increase in the number of people that we have in, in the armed forces. I do think, you know, I've said it a number of times throughout this conversation about not being complacent about things, what we can't afford to be complacent about is making sure that the next generation of talent is there to come into the armed forces. Now, I personally think that service in the armed forces offers a wonderful 
rewarding professional career. Don't particularly like the word career, but you know what I mean. Um, but it's a competitive world, and kids sort of growing up today, you know, quite savvy about the opportunities, and they look about, you know, what they're going to be owning in five years, ten years, and they think about the kind of wider benefits and, and all of that. And therefore, those of us who believe that the armed forces does offer, you know, an ex- not necessarily doing it forever, some people will, but some people perhaps do it three or five years and it gives them a grounding, it gives them some skills, it gives them a real sort of sense of purpose and self-discipline. I think that's incredibly valuable. But those of us who believe in the value of it have to stand up for it and champion it because, you know, there will be plenty of those people in society who will talk it down who will kind of sort of turn their noses to it. But I still am incredibly proud of the fact that I had the opportunity to be in the army and... It's something that I recommend to people when they ask me about it, provided they thought they thought about it. Because, as we all know, it's not the easy option in life. It brings all sorts of challenges and it brings unique pressures. But if you thought about that and you think that you can hack it, then my advice would be give it a go. I agree. I agree. We need to start wrapping it up. Dan, um, your book, tell us about it. When, Where can people get it? It's been a labour of love pulling this book together, but I'm really pleased that I have done uh, because I hope it gives a sense of the things that I think I've been lucky enough to learn over the past 15 or 20 years or so. And it's my story of how you can get yourself through tough times. And most of us in different ways at different times experience really challenging conditions in our lives. And this is my thoughts on how you can kind of navigate through those tough times and come out the other side of it. So although there are some pretty tough, dark moments in it, I've tried to do it in the most kind of sort of positive, upbeat way that I possibly can. So it is published on Thursday the 5th of March. You can get it from all good bookshops. As you say, you can get it online as well. And let me know what you think about it. I'm on Twitter. I'm on Facebook. I'd love to hear from people. Um, I've already had quite a few people get in touch just when I said that I was going to write a book and talking about the experiences of, of grief, I've had a lot of people from around the country, in fact, from around the world in some cases, get in touch to say they lost their wife or they lost their husband or their father died unexpectedly and this is how they cope with it. So I really hope that people will have a look at it, they'll think about it and they'll get in touch and and let me know what they think. It's called Long Way Home and it's as I say, in all good bookshops. It is very good, and I would encourage people to go and go and pick up a copy. Um, it had me, I think, I can't remember mentioned to you, in fact, I mentioned to Richard, actually, off air before we started recording. It had me, in the past, mentioned to you, smiling, recalling positive times, fun times, um, memorable times out in the desert, and, uh, but also, it was, it was, I was on a train, on, on a table, so four, four, I was on my own, two people opposite me, and I'm trying to, I was trying to hide the, tears as I was reading bits and very rare for things to do out to me I'm uh, not that emotional person so um, that's it was a very 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 good book very good book indeed um, Dan Jarvis MP on Twitter yeah yeah, yeah. and everywhere else it's been an absolute pleasure gents yeah thank you thank you for Enjoy your time it. good luck with it thank Dan you thank much. you so much and thank you for writing the book because you know I'm, I'm looking forward to reading it and I'm sure a lot of other people are as well so Great job. Thank you. It's a great job.